there was a country, Chino Achebe wrote, and I for one believe he knew what he was talking about. For to say that Nigeria is a mere geographical expression is to discount 1923 and the formation of the Nigerian National Democratic Party by Herbert Macaulay to fight for the rights of people he considered to be his countrymen. It is to discount 1934 and the formation of the Lagos Youth Movement by people like Ernest E. Coley from today's Bayelsa, H.O. Davis from today's Lagos, Eyo Ita from today's Cross River, to fight for the rights of people they consider to be their countrymen. It is to discount 1944 and the formation of the National Council of Nigeria and the Cameroons, the NCNC. It was formed by the young people of the day to bring together the two major political heavyweights of the time, Namdi Azikiwe and Herbert Macaulay, to bring them together in one organization to more effectively fight for the freedom of a country these young people consider to be theirs. It is to discount the constitutional conferences that took place through the 1950s and 1951, 1953, 1957, 1958, when Nigerians from all walks of life came together to debate and negotiate the terms under which they were prepared to live together. It is to discount Alahaji Sa Tafawa Balewa, who in the mid-1950s took a trip to the United States of America and what he saw there made him think to himself that if this country, with its trajectory, could make the transition from country to nation, then why could Nigeria not do the same? And he was so struck by this that he wrote a letter back to a friend in Nigeria where he stated, from today henceforth, I consider myself to be a Nigerian and nothing else. To say that Nigeria is a mere geographic expression is to discount the fact that this country, for an entire generation of young people, was a dream and an aspiration for which they longed and worked for. And therefore, when Achebe said that there was a country, he was also expressing a nostalgia for a dream that did not come to pass. Not very different from sentiments expressed by Anthony Nahoro. He was the man who, as a young man, moved the motion in parliament for the motion in 1953 for self-government in 1956, he was the young man that moved that motion. But many, many years later, as an old man, he wrote, this is not the Nigeria of our dreams. I understand this. I get this. I understand that this giant of Africa stumbled right out of the starting blocks and almost collapsed. I knew this. I know that there was a, a coup on the 15th of January 1966 that triggered a catastrophic series of events that almost engulfed the entire country in flames. I know this. I know that there was a pogrom in May, in July, in September of 1966 where hundreds of innocent men, women, children, hundreds of thousands of innocent men, women and children were killed Pregnant women had their bellies ripped open, their unborn children ripped out and killed simply because of their ethnicity. I know this. I know that there was a war, a terrible war, in which millions of people died, millions of children starved to death. Innocent men, women and children killed and even till today there is no memorial, there is no plaque to remember them anywhere. Many of them we don't even know where they are buried. I know this. I know that Nigeria stumbled early in its history and could have been no more. I know this. I can even understand why it happened. Because our founding fathers, Namdi Azikiwe, Amadu Bello, Obafemi Awolowo, our founding fathers were really and truly different. The fact that those three people were able to work together somewhat to bring Nigeria to independence is testament to their belief in the viability of one Nigeria because that belief was virtually the only thing they had in common. They were really and truly different. You see, Amadou Bello was born in Northern Nigeria. He grew up in Northern Nigeria, educated in Northern Nigeria, raised in Northern Nigeria. The first time 
He visited Lagos, he was in his mid-40s. Northern Nigeria was his, his cosmos. Their disregard of its growth, their encouragement of divisions, Obafemi Awolu was born in western Nigeria, raised there, he grew up there. That was the world that he knew. There must be one Nigeria with one constitution. Of the three, the one that was different was Namdi Azikiwe. Nigeria will attain independence on October 1, 1960. So it makes no difference if Sadarana or Balewa or Chief Awolu or myself will become the first prime minister. Even though he came from the East, he was born in the North. He did part of his education in the East, completed it in the West, worked in the West, played his politics in the West. Of the three, he was the most cosmopolitan. And therefore, it is logical that this concept of one Nigeria, of a monolithic Nigeria, of a Nigeria where any Nigerian could represent every Nigerian, regardless of tribal religion, it was natural that this concept of one Nigeria came most naturally to him because that was the reflection of his own sociocultural background. Amadou Bello had a slightly different concept of Nigeria, also based on where he was coming from. To him, Nigeria was not a monolithic entity. To him, Nigeria was a federation of the existing regions. At the time, you had the northern region, the western region, uh, the eastern region, and shortly afterwards, the Midwestern region. To him, Nigeria was a federation of the Northern region and all the other regions that existed in the country because for him, the Northern region was his primary constituency. Obafemi Awolu had a slightly different concept of Nigeria as well. He also, like Amadou Bello, did not see Nigeria as one monolithic entity. But to him, Nigeria was not a federation of the regions. He saw Nigeria as a federation of ethno-regional units of ethnic nationalities and this was also affected by where he was coming from because the region where he came from was dominated by one ethnic group, the Yorubans. So he saw Nigeria as a federation of ethnic nationalities, a country where each major ethnic group could have its own political unit from where it could relate on an even-handed basis with every other ethnic group. And when Nigeria became independent in 1960, it was the vision of Amadou Bello that carried the day because Nigeria became independent as a federation of the existing regions, the way he conceptualized it. But over the years, the country has evolved towards the vision of Obafemi Awolu because over the years, different ethnic nationalities have began to agitate for greater recognition at the federal level. And this is what has driven the fragmentation of the country from a federation of three regions to a federation of 36 states and one federal capital. But what really baffles me as a person is how over the years we have all individually evolved more towards the vision of Zik because over the years Nigerians have become more cosmopolitan. Maybe 50, 60 years ago it was odd to find a Nigerian who was born outside of his place of origin, raised outside of his place of origin, works outside of his place of origin, maybe has even lost ties to his place of origin. But today, if I were to ask how many people fit that profile, so many hands would go up. So many of us today are like Zeke was 60 years ago. Which leads me to ask if we have become more cosmopolitan, if we have become more similar, if we have grown to have more in common over the years, why is our politics still as divisive, as ethnocentric as it was 50 years ago? If over the years we have become more similar, why is our politics still locked in the past? And there are many reasons for this, but I can summarize them in two quick points. One, it's a result of the bedtime stories that we have all been told. For instance, you're told that it is the Igbos that killed the Sadauna. You're not told that the Sadauna was killed by Major Kaduna and Zogu. No, you're told that the Igbos killed the Sadauna. We ran away from his house when we fired the first few shots of anti-tank gun. So we sort of took, her, took away the women and children and uh, uh, took him. Or you're told that it is the Yorubas that betrayed the Igbos. You're not told that Obafemi Awolo was the Commissioner of Finance in Gowon's government during the war and it was his 
responsibility to evolve a fiscal strategy for the federal side during the war. No, you just told that the Yorubas betrayed the Igbos. You're not told that it was uh, General Murita Mohammed that led the army into Asaba. It was under his watch that the Asaba massacre occurred. No, you're just simply told that the Alsa Fulani came into Asaba and massacred the people there. And therefore, we keep seeing our reality today through the blinkers, through these ethno-regional blinkers that have been imposed by narratives coming out of the past that forces us to continue to interpret our current reality in accordance with models that were invented 50 years ago. The second reason is a very simple one. I don't care how cosmopolitan you actually see yourself. I don't care what your actual life path is. At some point in your journey as a Nigerian, you will be confronted by the question, what is your state of origin? And attempting to answer that question will take you right back to a sociopolitical reality that was created 50 years ago. But you need to answer that question. That is your ticket to assessing a lot of benefits in Nigerian society. It is through your state of origin that you access a place at university. You access your bursary. It is through your state of origin that you get employment into the federal civil service. You get promotion. It is through your state of origin that if you're ever appointed a minister in the federal executive council, it will be because of your state of origin. So that regardless of how you actually see yourself, whether you're an Igbo man that was born in Lagos and is living in Meduguri or, or Bautri has never visited his village. When you are asked what is your state of origin, you have to go back and take a label that was created for you by circumstances 50 years ago. And for these reasons, even though we have evolved socially into a more integrated people who share more in common, our politics has been left behind in the past. What can we do to begin to invest more in the integration of our country? Well, the first thing is to realize that integration is unnatural. It does not happen naturally. No, you have to deliberately invest in integration. No matter how organic any nation looks like today, there is no nation that is natural. Every nation is artificial. Every nation is a deliberate creation of men. Therefore, if we want a Nigerian nation, then we have to deliberately invest in a Nigerian nation. And there are certain aspects of integration that we must deliberately invest in. Firstly, we must invest in the infrastructure of integration, in the things that actually unite us physically, like roads, like bridges, the things that cause people to move from one community to another, the things that bring people together naturally. I cannot tell you, for instance, the damage that has been done to the fabric of unity in this country by the absence of something as simple as the second Niger Bridge. Sometimes we must value these infrastructural investments, not necessarily in Naira and Kobo, but more in terms of their impact on a sense of belonging in the country. Therefore, we must invest in these things that bring Nigerians together, like roads, like bridges, like the National Sports Festival, like music. These are things that connect us naturally. Any government that is truly concerned about integration in Nigeria will be prioritizing things like this. Secondly, we must invest in the economics of integration. As a rule of thumb, whenever people feel poorer, they tend to be more xenophobic. And therefore, to invest in economic growth and development is not just to invest in the growth of the GDP, it is also to invest in the creation of a climate that is conducive to integration. Three, we must invest in the body language of integration. As Nigerians, we need to be aware that we live in a very fragile society, in a society that is fractured along very delicate fault lines, and therefore, any word carelessly spoken or action carelessly taken may trigger a very intense and extreme reaction from any section of this country. And therefore, we must begin to become more aware of the fact that we live in a society like this and take care with how we speak and how we act. This is extremely important. Four, we must invest in the stories of integration. Growing up, the only stories we ever hear is how the Imus killed the Aosas and the Aosas killed the Imus and the Yorubas betrayed the Imus. These are the stories we hear. 
We never hear about how the Emmy of Katsina went out of his way to rescue Igbos during the program, or how Nigerian soldiers coming into Biafra were giving water and food to the malnourished children they saw. We don't hear about uh, Umaru Altini, the Fulani man that became the first mayor of Enugu, or of all the Igbos that are winning positions in state houses of assembly in Kano and Lagos. We don't hear these stories because they don't fit the mainstream narrative. Any government interested in integration must begin to push stories like this. Five, we must invest in the morality of integration. Now, I don't know what you think about Nelson Mandela, but you cannot take it away from him that it was his action to forgive the whites after coming out of prison that laid the foundation for a multiracial, peaceful, and democratic South Africa to arise. That singular action was his investment in the unity and integration of his country. We need things like that to also happen here. We need people who have suffered harm at the hands of others coming from another ethnic or religious group to choose to consciously decide that when they have the opportunity, they will not seek revenge. In addition, in terms of morality, we need to put the blindfolds back over the eyes of Lady Justicia. Justice in this country needs to become blind, particularly to the tribe and to the religion of those who stand before it. If you do the crime, you should do the time. Simple. Six, we need to invest in the politics of integration. Now, those who do not want Nigeria have been able to effectively politicize their points of view and build populist, radical organizations around our differences and our conflicts with each other. Those that want One Nigeria or believe in the viability of One Nigeria have to be able to do the same, to be able to build radical populist organizations around the things we share in common. And what are these things we share in common regardless of tribe or ethnicity? I'll tell you, we have bad roads in common. We have no schools in common. We have no hospitals in common. Poverty in Meduguri, same as poverty in Lagos. Bad governance in Sokoto, same as bad governance in Cross River. But it's not all negative. We also share the same memories. I mean, which one of us can forget that image of Rashidi Yakini shaking the net after scoring Nigeria's first goal at the World Cup? Or is it the uniqueness of our language? When as in Nigeria you say, Jinja Yoswaka. We understand it, whether we're Alsa, Ibu, or Yoruba. When you say, bros, how body? We understand it, whether you're Christian or Muslim, because this is a language that has evolved uniquely out of our shared experiences. Or is it the uniqueness of our rhythm, our music? That's how Fino can be rapping in Ibu, and they are dancing to him in Lagos, in Mina, in Kaduna, because even though they don't understand the language, they recognize the beat as Niger. These are things that we share in common. And that is why I know that, inevitably, it is not the tribe or the religion of the person in power that matters, because there is no major ethnic or religious group in this country that has not produced a leader at some level of government. And yet, the incidence of bad governance is widespread and universal. And it shows you that, in the end, development is a function not of tribe or ethnicity, but of the ideas of a man in power and his commitment to see those ideas to fruition. Now I believe that as today's Nigerians, if we can begin to invest in all these different aspects of integration, in that dream of a giant in Africa that eluded the generation of Achebe can become realizable in our generation.